Ants have been documented to carry up to 20 times their own body weight. If a human could lift 20 times their body weight, that'd be about 4,000 pounds, which would be similar to carrying a small SUV. I'm Fred Larrabee, and I'm an ant biologist. I'm John Hawks, and I study humans and where we came from. Today we're going to talk about how humans lift heavy weight and why we can't lift as much as ants. I am a computer. What is human? Is human ant? Ants are capable of lifting very heavy weights, and there are both anatomical and physiological traits that allow them to do this. If a human wants to lift something heavy and carry it, they obviously have to squat down and lift it off the ground. For that, they're using their leg muscles and their back muscles. So if you're gonna carry something for some distance, you wanna have it close to your spine. And for humans, that means either having it over your shoulder, strapping it to your back, or carrying it on your head. Ants use their jaws to pick things up and then use muscles in their neck to lift their head and lift the object on the ground. And then they can use their legs to actually stabilize themselves and carry that object wherever they want to go. The average person, if you want to carry something for a long distance, let's say several miles, then you're probably going to carry something like a third or less of your body weight. And for a lot of us, that's going to be a lot of work. There are people in Nepal who are working as porters who can carry 100% to almost 200% of their body weight for long distances. Collectively, ants can actually carry even larger objects. So Azteca ants can kill, disassemble, and eat prey items that are thousands of times their own body weight by working together. Ant mouth parts are called mandibles, and this is what they use to grab things in their environment, whether that's digging a nest, processing food, attacking prey. Mandibles work on a simple hinge and are controlled by two muscles, an opener muscle and a closer muscle. The closer muscle is incredibly large. In some leafcutter ants, the closer muscle can take up almost half the volume of the head capsule and can account for 25% of the body weight of the whole ant. Humans generate bite force with two major muscles on each side of the skull. The temporalis muscle on the side of the skull and the masseter muscle that comes from the cheek. And together, those make a very strong bite force. Bite force is generally measured in the unit of force, which is newtons. And ants are estimated to have bite forces in the range of 0.1 to 1 newton of force, which is approximately the same as the weight of a golf ball. Men can bite with a force of about 600 newtons. Women are a little bit less than that. An ordinary person's quadriceps muscles, the front of their leg, can generate about as much force. So that's a pretty strong muscle. An ant invests a lot more energy into the muscles that control their jaw movements than humans do. Over the last two million years, our jaws and teeth have actually reduced a lot in size. And that's probably because we started using tools instead of using muscles of our jaws. And the tools enabled us to process foods externally. The consequence of this is that we've had all kinds of problems growing straight teeth. When people have negative encounters with ants, they often say that they were bit by an ant. But usually this isn't the case. It's usually from a sting. The majority of ants have a stinger just like a bee. The experience of, of an ant bite would kind of depend on the kind of ant that you're being bitten by. Larger ants that have very sharp mandibles, say like a leaf cutting ant, could be a very painful bite. It would be more like being cut with a pair of scissors than being stung. Whereas mandibles are what ants use to physically grasp an object that they want to carry or pull, the main muscles that are responsible for lifting an object are in the neck. The neck muscles are what articulate that object up into the air. So this is like a human picking up a fridge with their mouth and putting it on your back. The human neck is composed of seven vertebrae. And those seven cervical vertebrae are actually quite fragile looking. Human necks are relatively weak 
compared to the necks of some of our close relatives. We've evolved to put our heads on the top of our spine and to enable them to rotate really freely without having a lot of force necessary to hold them in place. If we look at chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, they're spending a lot of time quadrupedally and that means that they have to support their head forward all the time. And that just leads to a much stronger neck structure and stronger muscles. Other insects that are known to be good lifters includes things like rhinoceros beetles, which have really well-developed neck muscles. Rhinoceros beetles have been documented to lift up to 30 times their body weight. They're called rhinoceros beetles because of these elaborate horns. And they use these to engage in male-male competitions, so fights where they try to lift other males up off the ground and throw them out of trees. When we look at how people carry heavy things on their heads, one reason why even relatively fragile looking bones can be consistent with load carrying is that bone is very strong in compression. If you can load a bone in such a way that you're pushing on it like a block, then that makes it very strong. So our necks, the optimum way if we're gonna carry something is to make sure that we're carrying it with a very vertical neck so that we're not twisting or bending or something like that because that's where you're in danger of actually failure. Proportional to their body weight, ants can carry very, very large objects, but that's not unique to ants. It's actually a general property of most small animals. Muscle strength and weight do not increase in the same proportion. What that boils down to is that if you take a small muscle and grow it up to a very large size, it proportionally cannot exert the same amount of force as that small muscle. Insects are small because they can't get oxygen through their bodies as effectively as mammals and birds can. We have a really effective circulatory system that takes oxygen from our lungs and courses it through our bloodstream to our peripheral tissues. And that actually allows us to get pretty big we're much better than insects because a lot of their oxygen transfer in their bodies actually happens through hollow tubes. And so that circulation doesn't enable them to get as large. When we look at some earlier time periods in Earth's history, like the Paleozoic, oxygen levels in the atmosphere were actually higher than today. And insects and other arthropods actually grew larger. So you see giant dragonflies from that era those giant dragonflies were able to grow so large because the oxygen in the atmosphere was actually higher than now. Human and insect muscles are actually composed of the same things and they work in the same way. The only differences really are insect muscles are on the inside of their skeleton, whereas humans and vertebrates, their muscles are on the outside of their bones. And that makes a big difference to the way that their limbs have to move and flex. The reason why we have skin instead of exoskeletons goes way back in our evolutionary history to the first vertebrates. Our skin enables us to interface with our environments in ways that are tremendously flexible. So for instance, our hands can grip onto objects and the small sweat glands that actually make our hands moist tend to enhance that grip. And our fingerprints are there to enhance the grip. The exoskeleton of an insect is basically like its outer covering. It operates as both its skeleton, just like a human, and also like their skin. And when we look at different types of vertebrates, you see ways that they've evolved skin that enables them to do those things. So ducks, for instance, have oily feathers, and that oil is coming from their skin that helps to shed water really effectively. We have oil in our skin that helps to protect us from too much water in our environments. Insect exoskeleton is basically like a composite material, almost like fiberglass. It's composed of long chains of a sugar called chitin embedded in a protein matrix. Ants are called social insects, which means that they engage in all kinds of collective behavior to accomplish really complicated tasks. So here the ants have actually cut free a disc of leaf and they've worked together to negotiate it into a good position. And then a single forager has grasped that leaf, lifted it up over their head, and is now running to take it back to their nest. 
They also engage in other kinds of behaviors like building bridges with their bodies or fire ants when their nests get flooded with water hold on to each other to create a raft of ant bodies to protect the queen and brood and nestmates from the rising water. So things like constructing incredibly intricate nest architecture using really, really simple rules. No individual ant necessarily knows the blueprint for the entire ant nest. Ant brains are particularly well suited to help ants engage in collective behavior, particularly by allowing them to communicate with each other with chemical signals. This takes place in the region of the brain that controls the antennae. Ants use their antennae, similar to like humans use their nose, to detect chemicals in their environment or from their nestmates. Special receptors in the antennae, called olfactory receptors, transmit those chemical messages to a particular part of their brain called the olfactory lobe, which are incredibly large in ants. Our olfactory bulbs receive olfactory scents directly from the nose. They're quite small relative to our overall brain size. They're tucked in underneath of our neocortex. So olfaction is something that's evolved a lot. One motivation for this evolution is that we actually smell each other. And the fact that somebody may smell bad or may be stinky may in part be because you don't smell some chemicals that some people generate and smell more of the chemicals that other people generate. So our social interactions are ones that involve almost a neural simulation of what other people in the world are gonna be like. That's very complicated compared to a mode of social interactions that's based on olfaction. Foraging ants, when they find food, will lay a chemical trail between where they found food and their nest. That chemical trail will tell their nestmates how to find whatever food they're foraging on, and returning ants will continue to lay down that chemical signal, building up that trail to a really clear sign for the rest of the ants on where to go to find food. Each ant is following a very simple set of algorithms and rules on what they should do, and the human analogy is the human brain. A single neuron is not very complicated. It turns on and off, but if you put millions or billions of these things together, you get human consciousness. If humans were to lift things like an ant would, they would have to have really well-developed jaws. And so you've got to have a huge attachment on the top of the head to anchor those muscles and great big muscles attached to a really powerful jaw. Then we'd also have to increase the size of our neck muscles and the muscles of our back to be able to lift, right? And so the back of our skull would have to really arch out to have these large muscle attachments. Fortunately, our backs are already big, you know, so we wouldn't have to shift them as much, but our heads would really change a lot. I understand, an ant is not human. <laughs>